So my name is Austin, I'm from Sheffield Hallam University and I'm talking to you today about working alongside students to evaluate uh, teaching, learning and assessment practices. Uh, lovely introduction from uh, Alex there um, and I'm going to be referring to some of my activities um, at Sheffield Hallam. I'll also be thinking a little bit about some of the work I've been doing up in the Scottish sector. So I'm also um, evaluating uh, the impact of the enhancement themes in Scotland. And I'm also doing a bit of work across the higher education sector as well uh, to understand um, and to explore evaluation practices. So I'll be drawing on some of those examples as we're talking through today with a focus very much specifically on working alongside students. So all of the examples I provide today um, have a, a component of student engagement. Um, and I don't think you can untangle uh, evaluation and student engagement, particularly when student feedback and student voices are so integral uh, to learning what's working and, um, and how we uh, make decisions about change. So this is what I'm going to be talking about. Um, I'm going to start with um, my suggestions on why evaluate. So why do we do it? Um, and I'll be asking you as the audience as well to maybe give you some, uh, give us some of your insights into why you evaluate. I'll then move on to talk a little bit about some of the principles of evaluation. And, and as Alex said, um, I'm encouraging a debate around not just why we do it, but how we do it and how we do that in an ethical, supportive, valued way. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about some evaluation strategies um, and uh, specifically ways that you can embed, embed evaluative thinking into your practices um, in teaching, learning and assessment. And then I'll be looking at some projects that we're doing at Sheffield Hallam just to give you some examples of the ways um, that people are approaching this. Um, and I'm lucky enough to have, have worked on or, or they've, they've told me about the work that they're doing. Um, and then I've, I've asked if I can share some of those practices with you today. At the end of the session, we will pause for some reflections. There will hopefully be time for discussion, uh, some challenge. Tell me if you agree. Tell me if you disagree with the things I've been talking about today. And also an opportunity for people to share the things that they might be doing. Uh, so to, to collaborate and share practices across those on the keynote today, that will be um, a great way to end the session. So I'm going to start by thinking a little bit about why evaluate. So why bother? Why do we do this? Why is this important? Why is this the theme of our uh, discussion today? So one of the bits of work that I'm doing at the moment is to work across the higher education sector to bring together people who are interested in uh, evaluating across the student life cycle. So that incorporates learning, teaching and assessment practices, but also thinks about access to higher education and also progress out of higher education as well. And I'm working with a number of like minded colleagues to think about uh, what evaluation means to us and we've defined evaluation and I'm really keen to know whether this uh, definition of evaluation chimes with you, um, whether you agree, whether you um, uh, would suggest an alternative. So the group that I'm working with, we call ourselves the Evaluation Collective, we're a group of advocates for evaluation practices across the sector. And we define evaluation as an approach which helps to understand and explore what works and doesn't work in a given context. And really importantly, that that is of value to stakeholders. So the aim of evaluation is actionable, evidence informed learning and continuous improvement of both process and impact. Now, thinking about my values base uh, and, and us as a collective, we particularly stand against performative evaluation. So task fo focused evaluation, the tick box evaluation machine. Um, so when evaluation is an expectation, but it's not valued. Um, and we define evaluation as a collective responsibility within organisations, focusing our attention and effort on transformative educational outcomes. Now, I want to know whether that chimes with you. Is that a definition of evaluation which you relate to or do you have a definition which is something else? Am I describing an approach which exists at Heriot? What do you have this evaluative culture? Um, and if not, then then what else is there um, or what else there is there out, out in the sector as well? Please do let me know. So do you agree? Tell me uh, whether this uh, definition of evaluation chimes with you and please do use the chat. Alex will be keeping an eye on the chat and others. And if there are things that you want to explore and you want to raise with me, then please, please do. I believe, so my stance is that evaluation, this understanding of what's working and, and, and isn't working can be empowering if we take control or some ownership of our own evaluative evidence. So when we start to explore and understand our own context, 
in our own terms, then we can start to understand and, um, and learn from our experiences. Now you tell me what that means to you. So, so um, uh, you know, tell me I'm right, tell me I'm wrong, but I'm really interested in your thoughts on that as well. So moving beyond my value base and so the approach that I'm taking to evaluation, I want to explore a little bit um, the principles of evaluation as well. Um, so this is something that I've written about at times um, and I've talked about, but I want to introduce to you as well in this keynote. So I started thinking about this most specifically in the middle of COVID when I was being asked in my own institution to think about the impact of the transition to online learning or hybrid blended learning um, on our students. And I was thinking about how do we know uh, what impact this is having? And by looking at the literature, by thinking about my own practice, by talking to practitioners, um, I came up with a set of principles for effective evaluation, which I still think hold true to the context in which we're current delivering, currently delivering our learning, teaching and assessment practices. Now, I could deliver a keynote on any one of these principles of effective evaluation, but I've been asked specifically to talk about the importance of student involvement. Um, and it's always been there as a core component of a principle of effective evaluation. Um, and I've provided the reference at the top of the page if you want to explore these in a little bit more detail. But to pick out another, uh, an, another couple that I think um, will raise their head throughout this presentation, I also think that it's important that evaluation is supported strategically within an institution. And as I mentioned before, that there is um, an evaluative culture, but this is also supported by um, strategic goals around continuous improvement, continuous enhancement and evaluative thinking. Um, so I'm interested in, uh, in that as well. It's also really important that we consider resource and capacity. I cannot sit here today and say you must evaluate more um, without saying you must also have the support for that and you must be resourced in order to do that. And if there's need for development of skills and knowledge around evaluation, then that should be available. And some of that we can do through sharing of our own practices, but some of that is institutionally bound as well. So I think that's really important that there is also a recognition of the time that it takes to evaluate and evaluate robustly. Some of the other um, uh, indicators on this screen, the principles of effective evaluation, I'll touch on a little bit as we move through um, this session today, um, but uh, particularly some of the more methodological aspects of this. But as I say, ha have a little read of, uh, of the work I've uh, published so far if you want to delve into this in a little bit more detail. But as is highlighted on the screen, the focus of this keynote is around student involvement um, and how we can engage students in our evaluation practices. So I want to talk a little bit about evaluation strategies. So um, if you're sat in the audience today thinking, well, Liz, I don't know where to start. Where do I begin? How do I start to think more evaluatively? And how do I develop my evaluation practices, particularly to understand what's working and not working in teaching, learning and assessments, but also bearing in mind what you've just said about building in student uh, involvement. So I'm going to focus on two takeaway uh, points from this. One of them is that it's important to embed a clear rationale for what you are doing and why, and that will help you to evaluate. The other strategy that I'll focus on is the collection of impact evidence. So both ends of this evaluative cycle. So I'm going to explore particularly how change occurs um, and how we can start to conceptualize or theorize how change occurs. And this will take us through a framework which helps us to uh, ground a rationale for why we're doing what we're doing, but also gather that impact evidence through sound evaluation planning. And the way I'm going to introduce this to you before talking about some of those more specific strategies is to introduce um, a theory of change. So what you'll see on the, uh, the slide at the minute is a load of arrows, connecting arrows between different concepts. And I'm go going to talk you through these in particular. I'm starting this discussion with a conversation about how change happens. So I think it's really important that we, um, we move beyond activity or delivery led thinking and we start focusing on outcome led thinking and that drives our decision making and it also drives our evaluation strategies. 
So higher education is quickly adopting a theory of change approach to evaluation, and it does have some merits in different spaces. I believe it's less used in teaching, learning and assessment contexts, but I think there are some useful points that I want to pull out today for you and think about how you might be able to apply this to your evaluative thinking in your own spaces. The first thing that a theory of change asks you to do is explore your own context. So understand uh, where you're working and what the problem is that you want to solve. So what is it that you want to address and how do you aim to solve it? So an exploration of your context and situation should be the first thing that you do before you implement a new uh, activity, a new pedagogic approach, a new assessment design. What is it that we're trying to achieve? So explore that context. The next thing that a theory of change does is it asks you to critique that context. So there is a level of um, criticality to our design of interventions and approaches and also the uh, design of evaluation. So what evidence do we have about what works? What has already been published in the sector? What can we use to drive our thinking for new initiatives and new approaches to our learning, teaching and assessment? And really importantly, what assumptions are we making about how change happens in this space? Are there any biases? Are there any points of view that we need to consider? Voices that aren't already heard in these spaces? And that's an important critique to, uh, to um, address. Once we've done all of that, we start to think about outcome-led or theory-led change processes. So focusing an attention on outcomes will force us to say, what will change look like and how will this be designed? And how will we realise this change and move beyond simply addressing what we do, our activities and our output, and moving the attention to what do we want to achieve? What do we want to happen? What, how are we going to realise those aims? And then provide some space for the discussion, the arrows connect them, the mechanisms for change. So how is change happening in these spaces? So that we're moving to a situation where we're talking about not just what we've done, but why we've done it and how change has happened in these spaces. And as you can see at the bottom of the screen, all of this contextual theorising of what we want to do and why leads into a well-crafted, well-considered evaluation plan, because we can link what we want to know with what we thought we wanted to find. To give you a very specific example of this then, consider a, a course-based research experience. So I was trying to think of an example that was based on a, in a, you know, something within the curriculum. So this is a particular intervention that has been found to have impact on uh, retention, attainment and progression within uh, the student life cycle. So that focus on student outcomes. So uh, a piece of work that I did with Advance HE, the references at the bottom of the screen, we looked at the impact evidence um, and this was one thing that was um, particularly useful uh, in moving uh, students towards those particular outcomes. Now, what you can see on the screen is a link between the intervention as it was designed and then how this can help us to think about evaluation planning. So it's important that there were clear outcomes for this intervention. So what is it that we thought a course-based research experience would help us to achieve? So in the short term, we would want students to understand the expectations of a course-based research experience and feel supported to engage in that experience. In the medium term, we'd want students to develop their research skills. We'd want them to develop confidence, self-efficacy and team working. And then following that logical connection of how change happens, we would then hope to see students being retained. Uh, so a, a de decrease in withdrawal, better end of year grades and hopefully a progression onto higher skilled employment or further research study. Once you have thought about the outcomes, you then think about how your activities will help students to um, achieve those outcomes. So you almost work backwards to think about what inputs do we need, our staff time, what activities do we need to uh, allow this intervention to take place, and how will we know that, uh, that students have been uh, engaged within it. In higher education, we are very focused on the middle section, the what we do. So our activity led, we're very focused on doing something. 
Uh, what a theory of change can encourage is a focus on not just the doing, but the finding out of whether um, uh, something has worked. So an activity, uh, moving from activity led to outcome or theory led approaches to design and evaluation. And this may seem like a lot of front loaded work, but this will save you time in your evaluation. Because when you come to design an evaluation, when you come to think about what impact evidence you need, and importantly, what your students can start to tell you, you, you align them to what you think and what you thought you might, uh, might achieve. So your uh, methodology, your evaluation plan is specifically aligned to what you think your outcomes will be um, and how you will evidence that. So a theory of change is one approach to um, conceptualising what you want to do, but also a really solid basis for your evaluation uh, planning. So how do you embed uh, student voices or student feedback, uh, as, was, um, as was introduced at the beginning of this keynote, to this evaluative cycle of theorising change and then exploring impact? So let's start at the beginning. Let's think about student voices that can be used to create and understand your rationale for change. So your why narrative. Um, so I think it's important at this stage in the design phase of anything new or any adaptations of our teaching, learning and assessment practices that we build in uh, student feedback and student voices into, uh, into that design. So creating a, a narrative or a clear rationale for why you are adopting each approach to learning, teaching and assessment and your planned activities uh, is really crucial. We can use a lot of different types of evidence uh, in this process, but asking your students um, to feed back into the what could we do differently or why should we do something differently is a really important place to start. It's also really important, as I've said, to focus on outcomes, but these can be co-created with your student body. So you, uh, you have learning outcomes or will have learning outcomes for your uh, learning, teaching and uh, assessment. But also think beyond that. Think about what else it is that your students might be benefiting from your activities and interventions. So you don't always have to think about uh, learning gains. We could be thinking about other uh, skills development, personal development that our students uh, might be um, achieving through your activities. And I think it's really important that you ask for student input into the creation of those outcomes. So a discussion about the learning outcomes uh, of a module or, a, or for a particular intervention, and then ask your students, what else? What else are you learning? How else are you developing? What else should we be capturing as impact evidence? Um, so to co-create those measurable outcomes from the outset with your students, I think is a really important thing to do. I also think it's really important that you consider uh, the, the, um, en the engagement that is currently in place. So I'm not advocating uh, for evaluation to always be an additional ask. So if you can embed evaluation into your existing activities by thinking a little bit about what you do before delivery, but also the strategies that you employ during and immediately after your learning, teaching and assessment activities and how your students are already involved in that um, can mean Mean that your approach to evaluation is proportionate and realistic. So for example, don't wait for your students to leave class before act asking them about how they found it. Use the time that you already have with your students to embed evaluative thinking. Some specific examples then, before an activity, an intervention or a teaching session, um, consider how you are going to gather your impact evidence. So, for example, you may want to design a before and after consideration of um, how change has happened. So you may ask a series of questions before your intervention. You may ask a series of questions after, and then you can look at the difference and, and how um, and, and how your intervention has, has uh, had an impact on change. So some way of evaluating distance travelled. Now, this could be more through formal mechanisms uh, and methodologies, or it might just be about a dialogue and a conversation about where students were and now uh, how they've progressed and what has made that difference. You can also co-construct or, or create a process for co-construction construction of these conversations. So encourage students to think about what the learning, teaching and assessment strategies are. Um, and ask them to share or, or send questions in advance of your um, of your interventions. 
check for assumptions, see what kind of questions students are raising, and then return to those um, at another, um, at another point in time. So you can look at how, uh, how um, learning or any other uh, uh, measure of outcome has changed. So building in these evaluative conversations and um, by planning this in advance of your session. We can also think about what happens during our activities. So think about what tools you have at your disposal, whether that's anonymous polls um, or any digital technology, whether there's ability to rank and prioritise um, aspects of learning whether you can embed storytelling or narratives within your uh, learning and teaching and assessment practices so that you're embedding dialogue with your students that have an evaluative function. So the kind of questions around uh, how do we think that went? What should we carry on doing? What should we stop doing? Um, what should we start doing that we're not doing already are really pertinent questions that we can start to ask. And then after the sessions, you have a whole range of data at your uh, uh, at your fingertips, hopefully, around student engagement that you might want to look at. So whether that's um, engagement with your virtual learning environment, uh, whether that's around the downloads of, of, of pre-available uh, resources. So there may be some quantitative data you can look at. And why not discuss those with your students to find out what they mean? Um, so what does this tell us about how students are learning and how effective your learning, teaching and assessment strategies are? Again, another example of evaluative dialogue with students. And really importantly, don't forget to record all of this. So not just that you're documenting how that change has happened, but then you are able to feed back to students to complete that loop, uh, to suggest how you've used uh, student feedback and student voices to think evaluatively and make changes. Um, and a point here is just to note um, that if you can avoid a transactional approach to um, uh, the feedback loop and focus on dialogue, so a continued conversation about what's working and not working, um, that would definitely be my preferred suggestion. So talking uh, quite generally about evaluative dialogue and embedding that uh, in your thinking before you deliver something and then also during the process of delivery um, is one way to approach this. The other way to approach this is to think about um, projects that you might have done as a practitioner, um, as a uh, someone who's delivering those interventions, um, or also working independently um, with um, evaluators or researchers within your institution that can help you support um, embedding student involvement in your uh, evaluations. So I'm going to take you through uh, four case studies now um, that I will introduce you to the methodology of them in particular and they in all of these examples they have a particular focus on meaningful student involvement um, and i and, and i stress the word meaningful um, on purpose there so my first point uh, in relation to project work um, evaluative project work and this is drawing on some of my uh, examples from hallam uh, the first one is around using disciplinary methods to evaluate change. Now, I am in a really um, uh, privileged position in my institution that I hear about a lot of work that happens across uh, our colleges and our schools. Um, and I co-chair what we call um, an impact and evaluation group, a uh, cross-institution group, where we invite speakers to come in and tell us about their, uh, their projects and their mechanisms for evaluating um, um, effectiveness in their teaching, learning and assessment spaces. And something struck me the other day when I was listening to these presentations is that actually our colleagues in the disciplines know how to evaluate. Uh, so our psychologists, for example, know how to uh, adopt pre and post measures with validated scales um, and, and because that's part of their disciplinary culture. Our colleagues in the biosciences know how to construct a, um, an, a experimental conditions so that they compare what's happening in one group of students to another group of students. That's part of their disciplinary culture. So evaluative thinking exists within our subject knowledge as well. And I, I wonder whether we can draw on some of those experiences within institutions uh, rather than thinking there's a, there's a skill or capacity gap in evaluative thinking ask the question about who's doing this already. So two of my examples on screen, one of them is my colleague Lizzie Freeman in psychology who ran a booster week to improve students' academic skills uh, and progression. 
And what she did is she implemented uh, pre and post uh, measures. So she talked to the students um, uh, and also uh, implemented a, a questionnaire before the booster week um, to look at their levels of self-esteem, self-efficacy, autonomous learning. And then she asked them again after the intervention to see what had changed. In particular, for this uh, example, she co-created her entire intervention, the Booster Week, and her approach to evaluation with student researchers. So it was co-created and co-led with student researchers. In the biosciences, my colleague Mel Lacey um, is, ex was exploring decision-based online learning. And what she had created is two in-class comparison groups. So uh, she had um, traditional ordered learning of online resources for one group of students and almost a choose your own adventure decision based approach to um, using online resources in another. And uh, she compared uh, a, a number of different measures. She had a, you know, a clear understanding of the statistical measures needed. Uh, and students engaged with this willingly. Uh, they consented to be part of this exploration. And some of that consent, um, and because I questioned, you know, how did students feel about that? Um, and Mel talked about the supportive pedagogic research culture in her um, uh, in her discipline, and the fact that students are aware that that um, that we need to evaluate the effectiveness of different approaches to learning and teaching. The second example is to um, look at participatory methods within evaluation. And this again was the evaluation of, of, of a course. This was a one year postgraduate professional development course, which was predominantly blended delivery. Um, and myself and my colleague, Alan Donnelly, um, uh, explored this qualitatively. Uh, and the way that we did that is that we um, recruited an advisory group of 10 current students and graduates to co-create um, the outcomes. So what is it that this course um, is, is delivering in terms of outcomes, but also the methodology? What would be the best approach to talk to students and to um, ascertain uh, whether this course is having an impact? And the advisory group um, uh, designed the methodology, which, which was peer-led interviews, um, and very much focused the evaluation on the outcomes which were relevant to them. And they were very much beyond the learning outcomes. So the things that students were um, experiencing beyond the learning outcomes that were anticipated in the kind of module and course documentation. Um, and that was, uh, um, again, an example of meaningful student involvement in the evaluation of a course that meant a lot to them um, as current students and as alumni. Um, and that was something which was um, kind of independently evaluated um, uh, and also funded. My third example is to think about um, appreciative inquiry. If anybody's come across appreciative inquiry before, um, it's a um, an approach which avoids deficit or problem focused uh, uh, deficit focused problem solving techniques that's a mouthful um, so sometimes when um, there is a requirement to evaluate or to learn about effectiveness um, this is uh, in, you know internalized quite negatively and the appreciative acquiry approach taking through a cycle of defining discovering dreaming uh, and de uh, delivering um, asks uh, courses to think about the best things about their practice under evaluation and to consider their perfect course scenario. And from that non-deficit approach, there's a real um, a meaningful consideration of what's working and what's not working. So this was independently facilitated. We've done this with course teams at Sheffield Hallam. We have a number of staff sessions, a number of student sessions, and then we bring staff and students together. And what this does is it moves us through um, the kind of blue skies thinking all the way through to what can we meaningfully change, some tangible outcomes to enhance the course, um, and specifically thinking about, about what it is that we want to focus on, whether that's declining NSS scores, whether that's embedding student voices into the curriculum, whatever the, 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 um, the course team has defined as the problem under investigation. So an appreciative uh, inquiry approach is again something um, which we can uh, um, adopt as an evaluative approach to course enhancement and it's been really successful at Hallam with uh, conversations with course teams. 
My final example is just to talk a little bit about infrastructure. Um, and we have a, a student researcher program at Sheffield Hallam, uh, which is designed and delivered by a central directorate. So when I'm talking about student researchers and meaningful student engagement, sometimes I'm talking about a, um, a system which we've had for a couple of years uh, where we recruit um, through our campus jobs uh, about 50 student researchers. We provide them with a training package for evaluation and research. We meet with them monthly to build a, a community for our researchers and we allocate the students to projects that are happening uh, within our colleges, um, within our bursary evaluation bursary projects because we have some specific funding for evaluation at Sheffield Hallam and any other activity as it arises and really importantly for this scheme all activity for our students is paid. So if they engage in, in training, if they come to our monthly meetings, if they complete their timesheets for their project work, just as I was talking about Lizzie's booster week, all that activity is paid. And again, meaningful student involvement, there is a question around incentivizing, but also valuing the input of our students in these spaces. Um, and uh, we're paid for our enhancement activity. And there is, uh, there is the consideration of, um, of how we uh, value our student engagement in that too. So in summary, I want to leave some time for questions and for uh, collaboration and consideration. I've given you a really quick overview of, um, of how you can work alongside students in an evaluative cycle. So I've talked a little bit about the evidence, the change, the outcome focus, and then again, the evidence of impact uh, at the end. Um, and, and I think if you can, uh, if you can conceptualize change in this manner um, and think about how you embed students within this, I think this can really make some steps forwards in um, effective practice. So I've talked to you a little bit about embedding student voices in the rationale stage, so the understanding of why um, and thinking about um, a rationale for change and how uh, you can embed student voices within that so the design of new activities or the adaption of existing activities i've talked a little bit about the change focus and the outcome focus that i think is really important in our thinking so moving beyond activity-led to outcome-led design of, our, of the work that we do then at the other end of the cycle, I think it's really important that we explore student voices um, when we are thinking about our impact evidence. Um, so whether this is embedding student voices within our existing engagement with our students or commissioning project work or uh, independent evaluation, um, I think there's, there are different strategies to impact exploration. At this point, I would also say there is great strength in practitioner led evaluation. Um, so you know your context better than anybody. Um, so please do value your own reflections in this evaluative cycle as well. And that brings me to my final point, which is how do you know your teaching, learning and assessment practices are working? Well, your students will tell you. Um, and if they uh, if you gather that as evidence, that's a really important part of this cycle. But it's not the only part of this cycle. My, uh, my note of caution, and I will end on this, is that sometimes we can give too much weight uh, to our student voices and we need to balance that with the other voices and the other uh, data sources, evidence sources that we have at our disposal. So making sure that we triangulate student voices with other impact evidence or rationale evidence is really important. So that was a very whistle stop tour of um, some of the principles of evaluation, the value base that I'm coming from and, and how you can approach it in different ways. I'm really interested in how confident you feel to evaluate your learning, teaching and assessment context. I'd like to know about some of the opportunities and challenges to working alongside students to evaluate learning, teaching and assessment. And I want to know if you've got any of your own evaluative strategies that you could share with people on the call today. Uh, I've, I've, I've given you some examples of mine and I'd really love to hear some of your own as well. Uh, I'll stop sharing the slides now, but there is a list of some of the, the references that I've spoken about um, or some extended reading that you might want to have a look at. Um, but then I will, I'll stop sharing and um, I'll pass over to Alex to do a bit of sharing of any questions. I really hope that was useful. It was very quick and um, uh, um, you know sketchy at times. I know that there's a lot more detail I could have provided, but I hope that gave you some insight into some of the things that you could do. Thank you.